In many RPGs and TTRPGs like Dungeons and Dragons and many others, we have different realms that adventurers can visit, from the Abyss to the Nine Hells, to a number of paradises, to Limbo, and many many more other planes of existence. So, from where are they inspired? What's the story behind them? Whether we are talking about Tartarus and Hades, Avernus and the Nine Hells, Mictlan and Duat, or however you call them, on today's episode I invite you to have a cup of something something to soothe the soul, loosen a tongue and let's talk about the underworlds. Hello all you funky people, Funky Monkey here, welcome to today's episode. How are you? How have you been? I hope that all you fine people are doing very well. For today's episode I took inspiration from the miniature I will be painting and from Baldur's Gate 3, the game that has me so hooked I barely have time for anything else. Don't worry, there are no spoilers ahead. Now, the underworld has always fascinated and terrified people throughout the ages and as such there are as many versions of the underworlds and afterlife as there are people out there. So if you are a world builder, I am sure you will easily find some inspiration for your own world or game or campaign or whatever. And if you aren't really into world building and are here only for the stories, I am sure you'll find some very interesting bits of information that I am sure were never taught to you in school. But before we jump in our story, let's talk about the awesome, awesome miniature I will be painting today. This, you fine funky people, is Balazar, the Lord of Access, an awesome and frightening demon lord. This amazing miniature was printed by one of my friends and I know he's been patiently awaiting for me to get around to painting it. Well, the moment has come. I hope I do it justice. I started with a zenithal, applying a black base, then I moved to a medium grey and finished everything with a pure white from above, leaving as many shadows in place as I could. The painting process will be done in two parts, so don't expect to see the final, final painting until next episode, as I really want to try and do it justice and I don't want to rush this. I will invest a lot of time and patience in it, so I hope you understand. Today I will focus on the Pelequin, the covered litter on which Balazar is being carried around, leaving him, his slaves and those he fists on for next time. I plan on painting the litter in a dark greyish blue, or bluish grey, while all the decorations will be gold. For the winged decorations at the back of the palaquin, I decided to go with an ancient Egyptian motif, with the wings including feathers that are of precious gems beside those of gold. Although the bulls are clearly Minoan and the winged lions are Mesopotamian if I'm not mistaken. He has roamed the land from before history was ever recorded and he has gathered the most lavish things he could find, denoting opulence in every aspect of his palaquin. Hope you enjoy the painting. With the miniature introduced, let's get our ducks in a row and go through the pre-story checklist. I don't have any coffee because again it's very late into the evening and well I think it's just very late in the evening for coffee right now. But I do have some amazing iced tea in my mousse cup. I have something something for the soul and my lovely assistants are around me and I'm sure they're gonna make an appearance in this episode as well. How about you? Do you have something tasty on hand, something to get you in the mood for stories? Perfect, then I think it's time for a story. There are some general guidelines as to how the underworld should run or what punishments should be dealt to their unfortunate inhabitants, but I also strongly believe that every individual person has a slightly different image of the underworld if they actually believe in it, 
and this of course goes hand in hand with believing in paradise and the existence of an afterlife in general. While paradise encompasses everything people consider as good, blissful and peaceful, the underworld encapsulates the deepest fears of human beings across the world. Both paradise and the underworld, of course, have their local particularities. And this applies throughout the ages and across time. But today let's talk about the general traits of the underworld from different cultures and see how we can tweak them to easily integrate them in our fantasy worlds. Let's start with something I know better and then expand to areas with which I am not that familiar. First off, the ancient Greek underworld, Hades, the realm inhabited by the souls of the dead. It was named after the god that lorded over it, Hades, Zeus's and Poseidon's brother. This underworld had multiple layers, each reserved for different categories of souls. Depending on how an individual behaves during their life, they would be assigned to a different layer. The bottommost layer was called Tartarus, and here the souls of the wicked were sent to spend eternity in a dark abyss where they would receive punishments fitting their deeds. Initially, this layer was a prison for the enemies of the gods, the primordials, giants, cyclops, and the Hecatocheres, children of the titans Uranus and Gaia and they were the embodiment of earthquakes and towering waves, of course things that ancient Greeks assigned to the supernatural and feared. Legends have it that when the war between the Olympian gods and the Titans began, Zeus freed the inhabitants of Tartarus in exchange for their help against the Titans. Once the war was over and the Olympian gods victorious, the Titans would be imprisoned in Tartarus and the Hecatocheires became the guardians of Tartarus. Tartarus was said to be so deep in the underworld that it took a bronze anvil nine days to fall from the face of the earth to Tartarus according to Hesiod. I don't really know how that was measured, but it's a good visual representation like in the comic books or in cartoons. In time, Tartarus evolved and it slowly became the prison for those so wicked, so cruel, that they deserved the more creative forms of punishment gods could come up with. Some of the most notable inhabitants of the layer were Sisyphus, Tantalus, Ixion and Eris, the god of discord and strife, the Danaides, the 50 daughters of King, of King Danaus who murdered their husbands, it was a home to the giant Titos, who forced himself on Leto, Apollo's mother, King Salmoneus, who imprisoned, who impersonated Zeus, Arche, the messenger goddess of the Titans, sister of Iris, the goddess of rainbows and messenger goddess of the Olympian gods during the war, and several others. I'm sure you've heard of most of them. The lair itself was lorded by Tartarus, a primordial being. Initially, there were only three primordials, Chaos, Gaia and Tartarus. According to legends, Tartarus was the son of Gaia and the monster serpent Typhon, or Typhon, one of the deadliest creatures in Greek mythology. What is interesting is that Tartarus is the place where the souls of the dead reached initially. Here they were judged by three deities and depending on their sins, they would be sent to other layers with only the most wicked remaining in Tartarus for eternity. The three judges were Radamanthus, a very wise king of Crete and son of Zeus and Europa, Escus, king of the Isle of Aegina, son of Zeus and the nymph Aegina. He was renowned for his spirit of justice and fairness while he was alive. And lastly, Minos, the king of Crete, son of Zeus and Europa and the father to the Minotaur. Radamanthus would judge the souls of those who came from the east, from Asia Minor, aka the Middle East, and even further from Asia. Escus would judge those who came from the west, in essence Europe, and Minos would judge the souls of Greeks exclusively. 
besides the individuals imprisoned here, the tyrants, the giants, the demigods and gods mentioned earlier, other souls sent to Tartarus were those of people who, through their position of power for example, committed atrocities. Also, here would find uh, an eternal resting place souls of murderers, the souls of temple robbers and people who murdered family members. But if one was, for example, touched by a fit of rage and murdered a family member and then regretted it or killed someone by mistake, these souls were taken out of Tartarus after one year and brought before the souls of their victim. If they would be forgiven, they would be moved to another layer. If not, they would be sent back to Tartarus and the process would be repeated each year after that, and so on and so forth, until they would be forgiven by their victims. Another less punishing layer was the Asphodel Meadows. This is where most ordinary people would spend their eternity. This was a more neutral realm, but there isn't much information about it actually. Perhaps because it was quite ordinary, quite bland. From what I understand, this was a realm where souls would continue their labors, in essence, continuing their mundane lives only in a new state of existence. This is quite boring and scary. At least the other souls got some action, got something to do. Imagine being a farmer all your life, expecting the sweet release of death only to find yourself in an afterlife doing the same thing, but only in a darker place, for eternity. That is scary and that is, I'll say the least, a letdown. Another layer was Erebus, but depending on the source and age, this was either the underworld itself, the darkness of the underworld, the darkness that people had to find their way through to reach Hades, or the area they needed to traverse in order to reach the judges. Hello, Mango! Oh. Another layer was or were the fields of mourning, where souls of those who died because of love or loss would wander in a dark myrtle grove, unable to let go of their grief. The ancient author Virgil mentions that the lair was mostly inhabited by the souls of women, which I find a little bit kind of offensive to men. Men could also love and lose and die of grief. Anyway. Last, but not least, we have Elysium, or the Elysian Fields. This was the ancient Greek paradise. Granted, not a realm of punishment, anguish and torture, but it was part of the underworld according to myth. This was where exceptional souls, heroes and great rulers, saviors and martyrs would end up. There was no pain, no labor, no grief, nothing that would upset these souls in any way. There were several entrances to the underworld. One of them was near the ancient settlement of Tenarus. Another one was the bottomless Alcyonian lake of Lerna, and this one was guarded by the Hydra, and another one was the volcanic lake Avernus. Depending on the time and source, the underworld was either in the far west of the world or deep underneath it, and there were areas where one could find portals to the underworld directly. This can easily, easily be integrated in any fantasy world. Having portals that one might step through by mistake and find themselves in the underworld, having to fight their way out or gain a place of prominence there, this would be a great way to start an adventure or even end one. Now, Romans borrowed their mythology around the underworld and afterlife in general from the Greeks with some minor differences. Among other things, they added that Tartarus was surrounded by three um, encirclements of walls. Beyond the walls, a river of fire flowed, and that there was a single gate above which a 50-headed hydra stood guarding it. The gate was flanked by columns of adamantine, an unbreakable material. I wanted to make sure I mentioned this because Romans were the ones who came up with the name and the properties of the Adamantium. You're welcome. 
I don't think there is a need for me to tell you how to integrate the underworld in your own world, but you could take examples from the Greeks and have a perfectly bland afterlife. For me, if there is an afterlife, which I really don't believe, it would be beyond torturous. If it's just an eternal, boring existence, like the neutral existence in the meadows. All other souls at least had something going on for them. Eternal torture, eternal grief, uh, bliss, but sheer boredom? Ugh. Anyway. Let's take a break and see how the mini is coming along. Gold, gold, gold. Balazar loves gold. I'm painting the winged lions and the bulls in pure gold, as Balazar would not accept any less. I'm trying to not get gold paint on the bluish wood of the palaquin, but it is pretty difficult as you can see. I've learned that when painting parts of a miniature with completely different colors, to first of course, pay more attention, and second, keep on hand some of the paint I've already applied, just in case I need to do some touch-ups. There are so many nooks and crannies that should be gold, and I will keep coming back to them and add more gold paint as I progress and I notice them. Once I'm done with the gold paint, I will come in with a bluish-gray to touch up things as I mentioned earlier. The only thing I stressed about when applying the gold was the circle that the statue on the back of the palaquin is holding. I broke the hand of it at least four times. If I break it another time, I don't know if I'm gonna bother gluing it back, but I'm afraid Belazar will have something to say about that, and I don't wanna anger him. I love this miniature, and I love how it's turning out. Now, we need to get back to the underworld. Let's move to other shores, but not too far away. Let's move to the shores of ancient Egypt and see what the ancient Egyptians believed to be their afterlife and more importantly, what they believed to be their underworld. First, we need to understand how the Egyptians saw life as it is quite telling. They believed that death was not an end, but a continuation of a journey, and that after death, they would have an almost identical life beyond the veil, and as such, they had the obligation to themselves of making the best of their lives, so that their life on the next realm would be as good as this one. Their goal was to reach the field of reeds, their paradise the mirror image of one's life on this realm. That's why they wanted to make the best of this life. To achieve this, they enjoyed good food and enjoyed sports. There is evidence that sport was a very, very important part of the ancient Egyptian's life, from rowing competitions to swimming to archery, gymnastics and something called water jousting, where two teams tried to knock one another off boats into the Nile while they were circling one another. They enjoyed board games and of course they had music and dance and festivals and so on and so forth. They took each and every single chance to celebrate something. They were taught to enjoy every bit of their lives. Their view of the gods was also an optimistic one, seeing the gods as benefactors, friends, even confidants and an intricate part of their joyfulness with, for example, Hathor being present at every festival in the form of the Lady of the Sycamore, giving shade and comfort, weddings as Lady of Drunkenness, and even funerals as Lady of the Necropolis, leading the way to the afterlife. By the way, Hathor was in essence the ancient Egyptian goddess of drugs, sex and rock and roll. But even though everything was peachy pink, there were of course those whom, upon reaching the afterlife, were not deemed worthy of living in the fields of reeds. So, what did the journey to paradise look like and what happened to those who were unworthy? Upon death, the spirit of the deceased would be initially trapped in the body, seeing how it was its home for a while. Believing this, the ancient Egyptians wanted to ensure that the spirits would continue their journey. 
For this, they used amulets, bracelets, different trinkets, and even, in the case of the more wealthy citizens, paintings on the walls of the tombs, reassuring the spirits that they were safe and reminding them to move on. Besides amulets and trinkets and paintings that aided the spirits, there were many spells and teachings that an ancient Egyptian would learn while alive to aid in their spirit journey through the underworld. A collection of such spells and texts was indeed found in the form of a book we nowadays call the Book of the Dead, and most consider this to be the ancient Egyptian equivalent to the Bible. Both the status of these writings and the name are wrong in every single way. But that's another story for another time. Initially, only the most wealthy had access to the collection of spells and teachings gathered from across the realm, and no two copies of the book were identical. There were scribes specialized in creating guides for the afterlife, so individuals who were sick or injured or felt their end was nearing would seek out such scribes and would have a custom-made book of spells and tutorials on how to reach the afterlife. Think of it like the, the ancient equivalent of YouTube tutorials. How to traverse the afterlife. For this, individuals would tell the scribes their life stories, accomplishments, fears, etc. This allowed the scribes to select the proper spells and tutorials. Regular folk would have access to what the local clergy taught and what teachings were passed down um, from their forefathers and or circulated in their area. So the book was not mandatory for everybody. But in time, more and more people started believing that they really needed such guidelines and scribes started selling books of the dead to the wider public in custom form. Depending on how much one could afford, there were books with more or less spells and walkthroughs. As time passed, because religion evolves to meet the needs of the followers and not the other way around, by the 650s BCE, there was a standard of 190 spells and guides that people could select from and include in their custom-made guidebook to the afterlife. Each spell had a price and if you had enough money you could add all of them. The only spell or text that every single Book of the Dead found thus far included was spell 125. Of course they didn't call it spell 125, that's the designated number it received. And it's a spell that instructs the spirit on how to act before Osiris, Maat, Thoth, Anubis and the 42 judges in the Hall of Two Truths at the end of the journey. This is so, so interesting to me. You have no idea. I don't know why, but the idea of having a custom-made guide for your soul to better navigate the underworld and perhaps reach eternal bliss is fascinating beyond belief. Okay, back to the actual journey. So after the spirit realized it was trapped in the body, escaped the body and understood that it needed to continue the journey to the underworld, it would take the shape of a bird with a human head, a ba, and set off. The journey lasted for 70 days and the spirit had to brave the underworld called the Duat. Here, there were strange creatures and demons that tried to tempt the spirit and confuse them so that they would get lost and wander the Duat forever, joining their ranks. The goal of the spirit was to reach Anubis and stand before Osiris and be judged. If the spirit made it through the underworld, they would stand in queue and await for their turn before the judges. Anubis would usher them in line and some of Anubis' daughters would offer cool water, refreshments, and would comfort the spirits before judgment. Once it was their turn, the soul would stand before Osiris and their heart be weighed against the feather of Maat, or goddess of truth, justice, balance, harmony, law, and morality. All the while, 
they would give the negative confession, basically listing the sins that they did not commit. Each soul would have a different list of sins that, it had, that they did not commit. As you can imagine, there is a difference based on the profession of an individual, besides the moral compass of each soul. For example, a soul of a soldier would have a different list of sins they did not commit than a magister or a fisherman. Sins on the list of the negative confession could be something like I did not commit treachery, I did not kill somebody, I did not murder, I did not steal, etc, etc, etc. After the confession was done, if the heart was in balance with the feather, the gods would hold counsel with the 42 judges and the spirit would be allowed to pass into Osiris' gardens in the afterlife, become an Aku, a revered ancestor, and would be allowed to receive offerings and be venerated. The 42 judges represented the 42 regions of Egypt and 9 of them represented more or less a god, such as Ra, Isis, Geb, Nut, etc. <laughs> I caught her. Caught her. Okay, the 42, the other 33 judges remaining were more terrifying and frightening for the souls, and they had very ominous names such as Bone Crusher or Devourer of Entrails. Their role was to simply judge the souls more harshly, trying to convince the other judges or to, to condemn a soul or to reveal if a soul by any chance was lying. I don't know if that was a possibility, but apparently it could have been. So basically the 33 would argue for the ending of the existence of the souls before them. If the heart was that of a truly evil individual and outweighed Maat's feather, the spirit would be devoured by Amut, the devourer of the dead, an Egyptian goddess with the head of a crocodile, the four legs of a big cat, a lion or a leopard depending on the era and the region, and hind legs of a hippo, the three main man-eating creatures of ancient Egypt. This process was called dying a second time. There was no place of punishment for the wicked. Their souls would simply be devoured and they would cease to exist. Amut would sometimes be represented as sitting in the middle of a lake of fire in which the hearts of those unworthy would be thrown, representing sacred destruction and purification through fire. On the other hand, if a spirit became lost in the underworld or refused to come with Anubis before Osiris, because they knew they led a wicked life, the spirit would become a mutu, a restless dead, and take part in tempting and confusing other spirits that would try and navigate through the duat. The afterlife of the ancient Egyptians was a blissful place where one would find all their friends and family, their dearest possessions, and even their beloved pets. And the spirits would enjoy the finest things in life as they enjoyed them in their actual life. This is an interesting perspective to have and in my world I do have a culture where people are always trying to see the bright side of things because the god that they are worshipping has a massive ledger with the thoughts, the negative thoughts of all those who follow them and once an individual dies they get to experience all the nasty things they thought and did. This is not necessarily a happy place to live in, nor is this a good god to worship. It's pretty dystopian actually, like happiness is mandatory or else you're gonna be screwed eternally. But my players haven't encountered this culture yet. Now, let's take another look at the miniature before we start wrapping things up. After a few final touch-ups of gold here and there, making sure Belazar is happy and the Pelagwin he's traveling in does not look cheap, I'm coming in with a lighter gold for highlights. Once I'm happy with all the edges being highlighted with a lighter gold, 
I will come in with silver for the final highlights. The silver I'm using to highlight the Merlons is not really thinned down as I want a pretty solid color. But for highlighting the bulls and the other smaller decorations, I am thinning the silver down as I want a clean diffused highlight. I'm taking my time highlighting all the edges. And although the process is a little boring, I quite enjoy it and in the end it will be worth it. I don't want to go for very very sharp highlights and that's why I will stop at this shade of silver and not go any lighter. As the painting progresses, if I change my mind, I can always come back and just add a little bit more highlights in a lighter silver. I'm so excited of how this miniature is turning out and I'm really curious what you think about it. Make sure you leave a comment down below in the doobly-doo. Now let's get back to the underworld for our final track. Okay, we've covered the Greek underworld. We've talked about the Egyptians. Now I want to wrap things up by talking about the Aztec afterlife, especially the, the underworld Mictlan. According to myth, the Aztec underworld was lorded over by Mictlan Tecutli and his wife Mectecau Seattle, Lord of the Land of the Dead and Lady of the Dead. As you might expect, this god was one of the most feared among the Aztecs and he was associated with spiders, owls, bats and the direction south. Aztecs believe that Miklan Tecutli was responsible for delaying the creation of humankind by trying to trick the god Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent god, patron of priests, learning science, crafts, arts, etc. Quetzalcoatl descended in the Mictlan to recover the bones of the creatures that came before so that humankind might be created from them. I don't know what those creatures that came before are or were and I couldn't find that many sources so I'm not even going to try to venture an opinion. Quetzalcoatl wanted these bones so he might create humankind from them. Mictlan Tecrutli was not looking forward to this and tricked Quetzalcoatl by having him travel four times around Mictlan and use a conch shell as a trumpet. Quetzalcoatl eventually declared that he was no longer willing to seek out the bones and would live without them, instead stealing them and hiding them. Upon discovering what Quetzalcoatl did, Miklante Kutli was outraged and ordered that a pit be dug close to the exit from Mictlan. Quetzalcoatl did not notice the pit as a quail startled him and fell in the pit, shattering and scattering the bones. As he gathered the fragments, the male and female bones got mixed up. He managed to escape the pit and return to the god Sihuacuatl, who mixed the bones with corn and a bit of Quetzalcoatl's blood and fourth sprang humans. But okay, what about Mictlan? What do we know about the realm itself? According to myth, there were some souls that avoided the underworld altogether. Those of women who died at childbirth, those who died during storms or floods, those struck by lightning, those who died a violent death and those who were sacrificed. The Aztecs did not believe in a paradise nor a place of torment. They believed that all souls shared the same fate, all reached the underworld regardless if they were righteous or wicked in life, and they all had to traverse Mictlan. The underworld was divided in nine layers and the journey apparently took four years. The deceased were buried with things to help with the journey. food water, weapons, a blanket, gifts for different entities that they might encounter along the way, and anything else they might need. The journey would start in the first layer, on the banks of a river, where the dead individual had to cross with the help of a Sholowitz Quintly dog. The second layer was called the place where mountains collide, and the dead had to traverse a mountain range where two mountains collided with one another and then separated. The individuals had to choose the moment carefully so they wouldn't get crushed between the two colliding mountains. 
The third layer was a mountain covered with sharp shards of flint that would shred the flesh of the deceased as they traversed the layer. The fourth was called the place of the obsidian wind, more or less. A realm of stone and ice where the wind blew so strongly that it injured the body of the deceased. The fifth layer was called the place where people fly and whirl like flags. Again, more or less. This was a place where the dead would be picked up by a vicious wind and tossed around before being thrown in the sixth layer. The sixth layer was called the place where people are shot with arrows. This was a long, broad path with invisible hands that shot arrows at the dead traveling the path. These were said to be the arrows used and lost on the battlefields. By the way, this isn't getting any easier for the deceased. The seventh layer was a place where jaguars hunted the deceased, would rip their chests open and devour their hearts. I don't think any of the deceased actually escaped this treatment. The eighth layer was called Black Waters Lagoon, the place where the bodily would finally be destroyed and the soul released from it. The ninth layer was a realm where the soul had to traverse nine lagoons, after which all of the suffering of the body would be taken away. And now the soul could enjoy the afterlife, right? Right? Wrong. At the end of the journey, the souls would find themselves before Miklan Tekutli and his wife, Mektekawusiatl, where they would be dispersed into nothingness. This is one of the most bleak endings, if you ask me. It makes me actually prefer Tartarus. Sorry, but why go through all the trouble and I couldn't by the lights of me, find any sources that tells us what happens if a soul refused to traverse Mictlan. What happened to those who refused to cross the bank? Would they immediately be dispersed into nothingness? Would their existence be immediately extinguished? Or would they simply sit on the bank and enjoy the rippling water and the sunshine. I, I, I don't know, but <laughs> well, the Aztecs had a very interesting view over life and death and religion in general, so it kind of fits, but oh man, it's a little bit depressing. So, as you can see, there are numerous sources of inspiration for your fantasy world. You can easily incorporate any of these three underworlds that we've discussed today in your stories. See what works best for you. They all have some things in common and you can easily tweak them to fit better in your own world, fit your own style. Or if you are not into world building, go nuts and bore the living crap out of those around you with this newfound knowledge. I think this whole topic deserves more attention and perhaps we'll revisit this sometime in the future, but I think we're done for today. Until next time, Potatoes 13th 9 is Wannabe. Thank you so much for the privilege of your time, I truly hope you found some inspiration and learned something new today and I can't wait to see you all wonderfully funky people here next time on Funky Monkey MP, the place where you get your dose of miniature painting, history, world building and trivia. Remember, be curious, take inspiration from the past and never stop learning, world building and creating amazing things whatever those are. Your mind and imagination are awesome and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Until next time, have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful, funky day. Cheers.